time. So about 100 to 100 people. 100 okay. to 150 people uh, record joins through the live streaming typically. So if they have any questions, we'll just post it in the chat uh, and then, you know, uh, you can answer those. And everyone else obviously will be posting their own questions on the chat. So that's how um, we share this session among both external and internal uh, people. So in both Lazardians and non Lazardians, yeah. Okay, I understand. Hey, so two more minutes and we should be good sure. to go. Yeah. And I think there will be people joining on the way. So that's always there. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. This session and uh, we are recording the session so that we can share it as well later on in YouTube and also within Lazada. So um, if you want to just go back and play back, you, can, you have that opportunity. Um, thanks, Arunima, for taking time out and actually doing this sharing with us. Uh, we have been planning to do this for some time, and thanks for taking the time out finally. Uh, so um, uh, there are a few people who has joined us through the Zoom, uh, which is, uh, a lot of them are not from Lazada. So uh, they will be uh, joining us through Zoom. And the others who are from Lazada will be mostly listening in through the live streaming, which is happening internally uh, and which Harris is doing of this session. Um, so any questions, uh, please put in the chat function of uh, Zoom. If you are, um, if you want to listen to uh, the session in Chinese, then you have that opportunity to just go to the interpretation function in Zoom, and um, you can also listen to the Chinese version, where Willie has kindly joined us to do the Chinese uh, in uh, simultaneous translation. So, yeah. Um, so just to introduce uh, Arunima, um, of course, Arunima and me, we have been. Uh, from uh, market research in, and we have been in touch from a long time. So we've uh, known each other both professionally and personally. And um, she's been um, earlier, um, she has been with uh, Gojek and recently she's joined uh, Yara. As most of you know that Yara is, um, uh, is into uh, technology for uh, you know, the farming and agric agriculture industry. So she has been, uh, she's uh, been in this industry of research, of uh, market research, of brand research, branding research from uh, quite some time. It's almost uh, 15 years. I think she's, uh, yeah, 15 years. Uh, Arunima has been in diverse roles, developing uh, expertise in development research uh, to help digital natives in solving their data and insights challenges. Um, currently, she is leading the insights function for Yara International across Asia and Africa uh, for agri-tech products. And before this, she was in Gojek uh, when she was, uh, she had set up the insights function for their newly launched territories uh, for Gojek. So um, I would like to invite uh, Arunima to just take over and um, over to you, Arunima, to take us through some very, very useful, um, uh, you know, some of her insights on how to, actually build insights to uh, build iconic products. So it's, it's quite an interesting presentation. I just saw a glimpse of it, but yes, it is, um, it's quite interesting. So over to you, Arunima. Uh, please take over and uh, share with us some learnings, yeah. Thanks, thanks, Sanjita. Thanks for the introduction and uh, giving me this opportunity to talk to the folks here at Lazara. So I'm, uh, uh, as uh, Sanjita mentioned about uh, the diverse roles and the areas that I have worked in, I think uh, as I reflect on my 15 years, uh, one thing that uh, I feel grateful about is that, thank God I started as an insights professional because uh, what I do see is that across all the functions, insights is one thing that is quite universal. Insights as a function is quite universal. And that's the reason I have had the privilege of uh, being an in-house researcher or an in-house insights team member across various industries, whether it's a development sector to a media sector to just navigating the world of super apps to now moving to agriculture, the fundamental of insights remain the same. 
uh, it is an uncontested fact that uh, insights uh, are the segue or you know it's the foundation or the building stone for building a great campaign building uh, a product feature or even to building up a business strategy whatever it is uh, insights is cold to it i think there's no question about it so i'll i'll not bore you all by talking about why insights is important and how to use insights and the journey to building those products uh, i have a slightly different agenda but uh, before i get to it uh, i would love for if we can um, do a small exercise so one second okay so uh what I'll be doing is I'll show you all a small clip. Uh, in this clip, just go through it. And as you go through it, it would be great if you can start putting in your observations on the chat. Let's make this a little more interactive to make it fun. Otherwise, it would just be me saying things and then answering questions in the end. So I would appreciate if we can you know, start pouring in thoughts and suggestions as I go along as well. So it would be fun to go through this session. So let me play this clip uh, one second. I'll just open the chat for me to be able to see what's happening on the chat. And uh, yeah, let's start with this. So I'll play the clip. And uh, as you see through it, as you like observe, uh, start putting your uh, learnings, observations on the chat as well. Uh, we can't hear the audio for some reason because mm -hmm. earlier when we tested, we could hear. Ah, okay. Let me try once again. Audible now? Yes. We are almost halfway through. Let's put in some observations, please. I'm playing it once again. Anything? I mean, you all can unmute and share as well if you want to. Anyone wants to just say anything about this uh, video which you just watched? It's uh, a particular uh, ad. Okay, I don't see anyone speaking up. Yeah. Very quiet audience. Usually, it's okay. yes, a very quiet audience. Yep. Okay. Um, yeah, so actually, I also uh, got my team to look into this ad and just I was trying to see how people react to it and what they observe. So if I don't have messages here, let me just share what uh, my teams have shared. And uh, I'm, I'm hoping that you'll be able to relate to what they talked about. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, 
So when we talk about the observations, I think uh, most of the time when I've played this ad with different people, I've gotten different inputs. Somebody is talking about, you know, what they're observing. So, okay, father and son are going on a ride. Uh, there's a mother and daughter uh, where mother is passing on the tradition of building something with flowers. Uh, they also talk and comment on the accessories that people are using. So something on a fashion sense um, about the watch itself per se, about the connection, about the sports, uh, different things, different people talked about that. And as I was observing, like, you know, how they are thinking about it, what they mentioned, uh, I couldn't help but categorize all that is being said into different buckets. So the observations around, okay, uh, father and son are going for a ride, uh, mother and daughter are making something with flowers, that's more of an observation, which is, I would say, like the data points or the facts from this. So uh, there's also some people went one level ahead where they can all they also talked about okay this tradition things like you know spending time with the kids and being able to pass or pass on to them what you learn is something universal because they talked about different countries and different things being shown so for me that's more of an ob information or a knowledge part of it um, the third thing was more around the idea per se that a watch is something that can be passed on as a legacy uh, so that's the more of the campaign idea that got talked about. But uh, when I was going through this exercise with the, the team members, uh, what felt missing was we are stating very obvious things. That's what happened, what we infer from it, how the camp brand translated that into an idea. What's What was missing was that how do we articulate this insight? What is the insight behind this campaign? And if I were to like have a go at it, I would say amidst all the things that I've shown on that slide, uh, the insight for me was the very fact that a parent worked towards passing on all the good that they have to the child to make them a better version of who they are. And it's not something that, uh, you know, you do it day in and day out. It's uh, So it's actually something you do day in and day out, but it's not something that you are thinking about it regularly. Like when I'm spending time with my kid, I'm not thinking that, hey, I'm going to teach him this so that he can be better than me on the, on certain aspects. It's not something like that, but it's still a very fundamental truth. Any parent that you talk to, they will not refute that this happens. And that is the insight which Patek Philip uh, took and translated that into this campaign that when we try to pass on so many things to our kids, we also have, uh, you know, this this watch which can actually be passed on as a legacy so that's where the insight got translated to an idea so today we'll be talking about the insights and we'll try and answer these three questions around it the first is what qualifies to be an insight so what do we call as an insight so as we just went through some of it is just data some of it is just idea Sometimes as, an, as insights professional, we just jump directly to the idea without getting into the core of why it's happening. So we try and understand what is it that's actually called insight, how to become an insights professional. And lastly, what is the right time? When should we, should we be seeking uh, answers or when should we find insights? So these are three broad questions that we'll touch upon today. Uh, I know it's quite fundamental, but what I'll, what I'll say is that when I was thinking about what content and what to share, uh, and I started developing it, um, I actually quite enjoyed the process because uh, to me, it was a good refresher of uh, insights and where and how we started. So I hope that people who have spent a lot of time in the industry, they would find this as a good reminder. And for those who are just starting off, it would actually be the good segue to get into and identify the right insights as we see through the data. So let's let me start with the first one on what qualifies to be an insight. So a dictionary definition of it. A dictionary definition is simply an amalgamation of two words in insight, which means that going beyond the literal meaning of seeing things. So you're not just observing, you're going beyond what you see to understand in our world or in our industry we call it to dig deeper to the subconscious level to find the unspoken truths 
uh, but as we practice, how can we simplify? Like, how do we know that this is just an information, but not really an insight behind the phenomena that's happening? Uh, I would say it's a it's a very simple uh, way to gauge it. Uh, as you may or may not have heard, it's basically that aha moment. Now, if you if you try and decode this aha moment, whether it's finding an insight, whether it's actually something that got you curious and you try and you try to solve and dig answers for it, and you're like, ah, that makes sense to me. That is what is aha moment. And any of those moments for you would always have these two elements. First, that first is that it feels like a moment of serendipity where you know all the confusion that you had, all the questions that you have suddenly are put to rest. And you can clearly see the answers that are there. So that's the moment of serendipity. The second is that it's something that cannot be challenged. So if you see yourself uh, like uh, defending a certain learning that you have on the field with your stakeholders, that's a cue for you that you haven't dug deeper. You need to dig deeper and find what the insight is. Most of the time when you are talking about these unspoken subconscious truths, to your stakeholders, you would not find those to be contested. You can be contested on the ideas and your inferences and how you want to take it forward, but the fundamental truths are fundamental truths. So for me, getting to an insight means getting to that moment where uh, as a professional, I get that feeling, oh, I, I get this, I think that makes sense now. So uh, if I have to take another route to explain it to you, uh, it would be more visual. So as you can see, the left side is just random sticky notes, different color sticky notes, uh, which are essentially just the facts or the data points. When they all come together, and if you like put them together to form a picture, as on the right side, you can see a clear vision being formed. The moment these sticky notes come together to form a certain vision, that's what is the insight. So whether you call it aha moment, whether you call it, it's something that answers everything that we, all the questions that we had, doesn't matter. The fact is that it is a fundamental truth that it will not be contested. Uh, I'll spend one more minute on the slide because it's not just the pictorial depiction of you know how different things come together to form our scenic stuff. Uh, it's also to understand that uh, to create the visual on the right side, it's not an easy task. So while I call insight to be a moment of serendipity, it's not something that, you know, it happens luck by chance. I'm um, reading through multiple reports. I'm reading through the data and suddenly like, you know, a bulb will light in my brain and I'll be like, oh, that makes sense. And this is what happens. That's not the case. While the fact is quite like, I get it, but you have to put in effort, just like the same sticky notes to create, go from left to right. You have to put in a lot of effort. Same is the case that when you are trying to find insights, you have to put in a lot of effort. It's not something that uh, just happens like that. Let me uh, take certain examples and uh, to just spend some more time to make sure you all understand what's data, what's information, and what's insight here. So uh, first example is uh, about pets. So families who have pets and how they feed pets. If we talk about data in that context, the data would simply be, okay, we feed pets two times a day. Information is going beyond, okay, what are those timings? Okay, we feed our pets uh, morning during breakfast time and evening during dinner time. Now, if you dig deeper, you will also see this behavior that most of these people, they tend to feed the pet first before they eat food. And that's simply because... Uh, if let's say, you know, uh, that, that's simply because they feel guilty about eating in front of their pets. So they make sure that the timings that they are eating in front of the pet, the pet is already served food there. Another example, and uh, this is more from an Indian context, would be about newspapers. So about 10 years back, I was in media industry in India. And uh, at that point, I remember we were contemplating and discussing that uh, Okay, newspaper is a dying industry. Everything is moving to digital. If you see now, we have all the information that we need in our mobile phones. So what surprises me is that 10 years uh, fast forward, we still read newspapers. At least in India, 
uh, you do see that the trend of subscribing to newspaper, the physical newspaper, the newspaper coming to the house and people reading it still exists. There has been an impact, but it still exists. And if you try and understand why it still exists, it, it gets you to this beautiful insight that when people read newspaper, it's not that one person takes the entire set of newspaper and reading it. It's actually like a morning habit where uh, families sit together, everyone pulls apart the pages that they are interested in. They take that, they read, and then they carry on with their rest of the day. So it's very much like a family affair and hence uh, it has a certain degree of nostalgia or a family habit, family practice kind of feeling to it. And uh, if you talk to people in this industry, you will understand that most part of the newspaper continues because of this habit. And that's the insight around why people are still reading newspaper. It's more around the nostalgia and just being able to spend time with the family. The third is more on, uh, it's an Indonesia example where uh, we tried to see why there's a spike in usage of private cars, uh, in over, especially over the weekend. Uh, obvious answer here would be that, okay, you know, you have you have families, you go out with families. So obviously on weekends, the usage is going to be higher. But again, if you dig deeper, the, the fact is that the families or the working professionals are trying to compensate for the time that they have not been able to spend with their families over the weekdays. And hence on the weekdays, you do see more outings. I mean, you can spend time with family at home as well. But it's more of compensating or overcompensating for the lack of time during the weekdays. And that is what uh, uh, triggers a lot more of weekend car usage. Uh, so I, I hope uh, this explains uh, the concept of like being able to segregate the data information from the inside. But just some examples, and I'll be happy uh, to hear like later from you all on like, you know, some of the other examples that you have experienced as well. Uh, I'll end the question one, which is what is an insight on this note? This is a very common visual that uh, has taken round on LinkedIn. Uh, but I felt I liked it for its simplicity because it tells you the journey that from an, from the data to an insight, what it actually means. Data is just the random facts collected together. When you start categorizing them in different buckets, in different themes, that's what the information is. And when you start connecting those pieces, those categories with some logic around it, some process around it, that's where you get into the process of finding the insights. And then you get to the genesis of why certain things are happening. That's actually the insight, which eventually gets translated into forming an idea. So yeah, that sums up the question one, which is what qualifies to be an insight uh, please do pour in your questions or anything or any thoughts that you have in mind on the chat so that towards the end, we can take it up. Uh, in the interest of time, I'll just move to the second part, which is on how to become an insights professional. Uh, now, a caveat here, when I say how to become an insights professional, I'm not talking about how to become a user researcher or a market researcher, what degrees you need and what you need. Uh, to me, insights professional is actually anyone practices this very uh, process of uh, trying to find the whys of what, what you're observing and seeing. It can be a product manager, it can be a marketer, it can be a commercial manager. Anyone who is asking these questions, anyone who puts in efforts to get an answer is an insights professional. And if I try to see what are the elements or the essentials of this insights professional, I don't, uh, these are the three things that stand out for me. Anyone who practices that know what their information sources are. They know exactly to look, they know exactly where to look for when they're looking for the information. Secondly, when they start looking through the information sources, they exactly know where to focus on. And the third thing is that they keep practicing it to master this art. And when I say they keep practicing it, I mean, I don't mean that they take every project and they dig deeper into every single project. It's just that that's how they intuitively behave at a professional level, at a personal level. You try and keep finding the whys of the things. So let's start with the first one, which is the information sources. Uh, broadly, we know there are two different kinds of information sources, primary data sources and secondary data sources. If we talk about back in the day, 
like 15 years back when we when at least I started my career uh, careers professions were actually being segregated by I'm a primary uh, I'm a primary researcher secondary researcher people will try and specialize in one over the other but we all know that we don't uh, operate in the same world we operate in a world where it's just simply interconnected data sources uh, you all will agree that uh, you know as you work through managing expectations of your stakeholders as you talk to your managers your leadership so i'm sure you would have come across these questions your way that okay survey says this but can we uh, cross uh, you know cross reference this with the reviews that we are having for the app can we check what's happening on social media what are people talking about us on social media uh, your insights say this but the actual transaction data something say something else so the way research was earlier and was conceptualized earlier to what it is right now, uh, what I can say is that the lines between the data sources are getting blurred. People in this industry are expected to see through multiple types of data sources and being able to form the insights. So what this means for us, I mean, the way of finding the insights is same, but what this means? Uh, in my opinion, what this simply means is that unless and until we have the knack or the ability to look at the right place at the right time, we will simply be spending so much time looking through all possible data to get the insight and the process of getting to it will just getting long, will just keep getting longer and longer. So today, uh, as core part of this chat, I do want to talk about how to see through all this information that comes our way in, uh, in an attempt to get to the insights faster. Uh, so as a hack or as a, as a learning curve, I would say that if we can internalize these five breeding grounds of insights, and when I say breeding grounds, it simply means that as you are navigating through the humongous amount of data that comes our way, if you come across any of these five situations, you should stop then and there. You should make sure that you are investing enough time to diagnose and get to the whys of these scenarios that you have seen. Uh, I'm sure you'll be able to land to your insights faster. So let me start with the first breeding ground. So first breeding ground is anomalies. Uh, to explain, it simply means deviations, something that's uh, unexpected, surprise data. So, for example, you are testing a creator and uh, based on your intuitive sense, you felt like this campaign would bomb. But what you see is it's actually being liked by the audiences and it's, the numbers are way higher than what you see in the norm. Or you are doing a brand tracking and you suddenly see awareness of your brand increasing significantly without much campaigns and stuff being run. Or you suddenly see a competitor uh, increasing their presence in the market. So these are all the surprise data, unexpected things that you observe. And any moment that we see these kind of trends, we know that this is something we need to dive deeper on. An example of how anomalies can, uh, can help create better product features or better campaigns is uh, what I'll say is a fraud det detection. So when I was with Gojek, uh, I mean, fraud is something that is just there. All the super apps, e-commerce players, they all have a dedicated fraud detection teams. The job is to simply identify what is... Uh, an anomaly in the transaction data, figure out why it's happening and then have product and solutions out there to be able to tackle that. Rightly so, our uh, a right example here for Gojek would be that uh, we did see fraud in terms of account takeovers increasing significantly. Uh, our driver team put this together with the, the product team and then they launched the face recognition feature. And after this launch, we do see are the, the fraud cases being reduced by like 60% in a matter of three months. Likewise, any other similar app, if you go for Food Panda as well, the face verification is something that works and most of these companies do employ that. 
Uh, interestingly, when I was trying to find what are the different features uh, available for fraud detection, uh, I, I came across this news which talked about Lazada's efforts being recognized by SPF because with the, the technology and the dedicated algorithms, Lazada was able to reduce, uh, uh, significantly reduce the e-commerce fraud cases. So as you can see, the premise of all these fraud cases or fraud detection is simply finding these anomalies, understanding the reasons why this happens, and then translating that into product features campaigns to be able to support and reduce those. So that's just an example of anomaly. I'll move to number two. So a second breeding ground for me is the confluence. So when I say confluence, it simply means that different trends in the markets are coming together. Uh, a classic a classic case here would be COVID time. So whether it's work from home, whether it's uh, you know the surge in e-commerce, surge in uh, food delivery, these are all the things that happen because certain certain trends came together uh, and uh, people started behaving in a certain way, forced environment factors, but these trends forced certain things, certain services to pick up. And that is what is an easy example for confluence. Now, if, if I look at more recent example, uh, it's impossible to like do a presentation these days and not talk about chat GPT. So for me, uh, for me, the recent trend where the confluence can be a good example is chat GPT. Uh, the first example that you see here is actually taken from LinkedIn. Uh, I don't know about you all, but I'm sure in some way you all would have experienced that. But uh, nowadays, when you open LinkedIn, almost every second feed is about chat GPT in some way or the other. And these prompts and playbooks are something that I see every now and then with all possible people putting these things together for different industries. You have prompts for research, you have prompts for, for advertising, prompts for data science, but it just exists everywhere. Now, when I was thinking about it, I felt like uh, it's actually a result of few trends coming together. Uh, in my opinion, the trends that led to, led to it are uh, first, millennials fearing for their relevance. That is something big. You talk to any, any millennial, layoffs or no layoffs, there is that general feeling about staying relevant in the industry. With the second trend, and that, that brings me to the second trend where the technology is moving at such a pace that even the veterans who have uh, a take on how industry will shape, uh, they find themselves clueless about how the industry is progressing and what's going to happen. And the third trend here is the LinkedIn influencer world. Everyone on LinkedIn is trying to be an influencer. They're trying to get to the concept of personal branding and use this. And that's where when all these three things come together, uh, stuff like playbooks do come in handy that, you know, you're not being redundant. You can use these pro prompts to boost your productivity. As an influencer, you are leveraging on that to create content and uh, boost your reach in the market. Uh, similar to that is your second visual here, which again encashes on chat GPT and at the same time on the fear of being irrelevant in the market. Uh, just an outdoor ad talking about your skills are actually irreplaceable. Chat GPT cannot come and make this building essentially. Uh, the third visual is more tangible where uh, you do see uh, chat GPT as a function being integrated in different services to be able to help users. Uh, if I talk about agri space, uh, I found it quite fascinating that most of the agri tech players are also incorporating chat GPT in uh, their uh, you know, tools to connect with farmers. It's simply because the cost of the content development in agri is quite high. So if you can leverage on these tools and have a way to engage with the farmers, it's something that's uh, a more cost-efficient solution. So as you can see, like the confluence is simply just different trends coming together for opp opportunities to be created, whether it's uh, for your personal branding through these prompts or through the campaigns, but you're leveraging on multiple trends and trying to utilize that in your favor. So that's uh, number two. We talked about anomalies. We talked about confluence. Uh, okay, yeah, this is interesting. While we all talk about AI, 
Uh, I found this eye. And as you can see, we go from bad. Because uh, why uh, AI, generative AI, is something uh, we are we know that it's a buzzword and everyone is talking about this as a trend. This is an interesting consultancy which takes an anti-AI take. Uh, I'll let you all watch and enjoy this clip, uh, but it's it's quite interesting, and I'll be uh, I'm I'll be watching the space quite closely to see what plays up more like are we talking about tangible solutions around this or we will actually go in that zone where this also becomes a fad and just like this client people are just uninterested in it so yeah that's confluence let's keep watching the trends and see what makes sense for the industries that we operate in the third and a more common one is frustration when we talk about seeking insights from from a product journey standpoint from uh, having a value proposition or from developing a campaign. This is something as uh, researchers, we bank on a lot. What are your frustrations, frictions, pain points? And on this uh, ideation and idea creations do happen. Uh, so a simple example here, it's a beautiful ad by IKEA, which says proudly, uh, like proud to be the second best, basically. Uh, for me, the insight here, simply, especially as a, you know, parent of two kids is that we, we buy so many things, we invest on so many things to make our kids independent. But at the end of the day, uh, there is nothing beats, uh, like, you know, the kids would still be dragging you to the bathroom to brush their teeth, to help them with their chores, no matter what you have in the IKEA case, it's a stepping stool or a high chair, you buy these things to make it easier, but kids don't like it, they will make you work. And IKEA has taken this uh, frust so-called frustration or a friction point in a very beautiful campaign where they're like, you buy these things, but we also know that we will not be used as often as you thought, and we're happy to be the second best here. Uh, okay, let me move to the fourth, which is orthodoxies. So again, um, quite a common area. Lots of brands uh, have played around this area, lots of product features have been enhanced based on these. But uh, to explain, it simply talks about challenging the norms. So if I talk about campaigns, uh, a lot of campaigns in Asia come to my mind where the, uh, when we have challenged the norms, we have seen more men being in kitchen, helping with household chores. So that's a classic example of uh, challenging the norms. If I talk about product features challenging the norms, uh, it's actually a dating industry that comes to my mind. So if you talk about Tinder, where anyone can initiate the conversation, on the other hand, you have Bumble, which has uh, helped to give this, uh, you know, give this authority or give this power to women to initiate the chat. So again, it's just challenging the norm. Like typically when you talk about dating, you know, it's generally considered uh, men to be making the first move or men to be asking out. But to from a safety perspective, Bumble included this feature wherein it's the women who need to initiate. They see through and they decide whom we whom they want to talk to. So these uh, orthodoxies again is something that can play up either in campaigns or in product features. Uh, an example that I would like to show here is uh, by L'Oreal Paris, which is uh, just taking up a stand on street harassment. So as this ad goes along, you will see that uh, they have taken quite a provocative route. They have called the norms, the conventional beliefs as they are in, in an outdoor visual, which is quite catchy, which will make people stop and see what this is. Uh, it's provocative and anybody reads it. And uh, they've asked people to take a stand. And if you see this, uh, how beautifully it's being done. They got people riled up with these conventional things being talked about, got people to pull it apart. And that's where the message comes in. You need to take actions to stop it. So that's another example of uh, orthodoxies, conventional beliefs, and how they are being challenged and being leveraged by different brands and products. The last uh, and my favorite, actually, 
is extreme at least. So uh, by profession or like how I started, I have been a quantitative researcher. That's how I started my career. And now as a quantitative researcher, when you are looking through open ends, when you're looking through open end data, your job, your the first and the foremost job is to smoothen the curve. So you take the outliers and you remove them, smoothen it, report the averages. That's the standard right? that we typically do. But this is quite interesting. Uh, I mean, wherever it makes sense, it's also important to spend some time on these extreme things that you observe, the outliers that you see in your data and see whether it's throwing up any new trend. A classic example for me here is uh, privacy and iPhone. Uh, I, I remember when uh, like Facebook and Instagram were still like new in the market and everyone was just joining these platforms. So I had a friend who decided not to be on any of these platforms. Uh, you know, very rare finds, but that person decided at that point when it was just picking up, I don't want to be on the platforms. In fact, uh, he recently created his LinkedIn profile, like uh, just during the COVID time. Now, what you see there is like, there were still some people who were concerned about privacy, who didn't want to just share everything that's happening. Uh, that's like at that time, and you would find that funny, like, you know, there's nothing to hide what you're doing. So now, uh, iPhone actually using it and converting that as one of its added advantages. I mean, nobody doubts iPhone to be a great phone. And that's the reason, like, you know, there are such high penetration. But privacy is one thing that has actually given iPhone a clear edge over the other, other players in the market. So, I mean, it's very clear to say that iPhone did have, Apple did have a pulse of the market. And that's the reason they could play up on it. And uh, it's something that uh, nobody can test. So that's a classic example of uh, using extremities in your favor because you never know that could actually shape up what the future looks like. Uh, another similar bit to to actually track would be the environment, uh, you know, save the environment, save water, save food, zero waste thing. It's still, uh, it has grown a lot. A lot of companies are talking about it, taking a stand. But what's interesting is that there, is, there are also quite a few unlikely industries who are also taking a stand on it. And it's a matter of time to see how taking a stand right now on these things will play out for these companies. But uh, yep, another interesting space to watch and learn. So with this, uh, I would wrap up the second question, which is about how to be an insights professional. So we did talk about the information sources. We talked about how, you know, the data that's coming our way is increasing significantly. And these are just five breeding grounds that we talked about, anomalies, conflu confluence, frustration, orthodoxies, and extremity, that if we know where and what to look for, it would be easier to land on the insights. Uh, just a caveat here that, while these breeding grounds are interesting, as we go through it, we do know we will be, uh, like as we go through it, I'm sure in certain scenarios, you will reach these situations. But a reminder, a job doesn't end to identify, okay, this campaign, this is the breeding ground, or I'm looking into something, I find myself in, in an intersection of multiple trends. This is, this is actually the starting point. If you find yourself in any of these situations while seeing through the data, that's you know that this is where you need to dive deeper and that's where your job begins. You know that you have to spend time here. You have to keep asking wise to get to what is the real insight here. Uh, just taking a minute here to talk about asking the wise. I mean, yes, uh, we can say that finding an insight is an art, but we all know that there are a lot of tools that are available our way to be able to find these insights. So if you guys are not aware, I would strongly recommend to spend some time on the internet and read about these projective probing techniques. Depending on the situation that you are in, you will find yourself leaning towards one over the other, but these are effective scientific tools that can come in handy to dive deeper and land to the specific insights. 
So with this, I wrap up on uh, how to become an insights professional. The third, the third question is uh, when, when to seek insights. Um, I mean, this is something when I talk to the stakeholders, I've often find I often find myself in these conversations where we are discussing, okay, should we do a foundational research right now, or we have these ideas, we take it to the users and test it out, which one makes more sense. And the fundamental question is like, when should we go about finding the insights for the problem at hand? Uh, I have a very straightforward answer to it. The answer is simply is always. Brand building doesn't stop. It's a continuous exercise. No matter which area, which platform, you are constantly building your brand, whether it's you know how your website looks like, how your social media presence looks like, how you uh, you know who are your representatives for different events. Everything contributes to the brand building. Likewise, our insights journey should also be continuous. It can never if if we find ourselves in a situation where we are working with our stakeholders in a very reactive way. Uh, they are planning to launch a certain feature. They have requirements. We do research, get back to them. Uh, I think we know that we need to put an end to it because insights need to be a continuous journey. We should have our tools in place to make sure uh, not just the research team, but also the people who will take these insights and make decisions. They have a constant pulse of the market. You're regularly going out, talking to your users to get these insights. So yes, anyone who comes to you, when and what to do, make sure you have this answer that we need to have a regular pulse of the market and you need to invest in it. There are different tools available, different forms work in different industries, but we need to have a constant pulse of the market. With this, uh, I'll just touch upon um, how to, like we've talked all about insights, what the insights is, uh, what, where we need to focus on, when we need to take this up. But uh, if we talk about bringing insights to life and creating ideas, uh, I like this very simple 4i framework, which helps to get from having the data points to generating insights, to synthesizing and making sense of what is relevant for our company or our brand. This is something that, you know, you can have a spin-off of this for your product feature development. You can have a spin-off of this for your uh, marketing campaigns. But if you see at all these four stages, at, in some way or the other, research is needed. And if you have a continuous cycle, you'll not have to invest time in doing dedicated researchers. So you keep inspecting data points, looking at the trends to generate insights. You will land into something that your stakeholders can act on. Uh, a more of an internal, internalization exercise to know what makes sense for our company. The third step is to convert these insights to an idea. Again, uh, a lot of people do these through internal workshops, but in, in quite a number of industries, these insights are also taken back to the users in an ideation workshop to build ideas. Comes back to the company to have fully conceived ideas taken to the taken again to the market to see which one makes more sense in the market to be launched. But that's just a very simple four eyes framework to bring your insights to, to life. Uh, yep, so I think I've covered all these three questions. So I'll just do a quick recap. Uh, we talked about insights. We spent good amount of time talking about what separates insights from the data or the information. But to sum up, what qualifies to be an insight it has to be a moment of serendipity, which is something that cannot be challenged. So you need to make sure when you are giving your advice for a certain phenomena, it is a fundamental truth. You know that it is hard to challenge. When we talk about becoming an insights professional, uh, a easier way in the world right now where there is just so much of data is to remember these breeding grounds, the five grounds that we talked about. So that when we are sieving through the data, it's much easier to know where and how to find things. Um, on this point, we also talked about having ongoing, ongoing regular programs to have the pulse of the market will make this process much easier. And lastly, uh, is when to seek insights. That's where uh, the answer is simple. It's always, it is a continuous process. So, all right, that's uh, that's it for me. I'll be happy to answer any questions you all have. 
Thank you, Arunima. Uh, I think currently we don't have any questions in the chat group, but um, in the uh, yeah in the chat uh, I just checked. But in case anyone has any questions, uh, please feel free to just unmute and ask questions right now. Um, so um, we have hi hi Arunima. Hi Kriti. Hi. Uh, thank you for this great uh, lecture on insights. So uh, I just have one question. So when uh, you were taking us through uh, the slide on uh, insights, where you had three uh, examples, data, information, and insights, yeah. uh, there was an example of cat feeding the cat twice a day. Yeah. Uh, so I just wanted to understand, uh, like you already have this data point that people feed their pets twice a day, and then you have information related to that. And then the uh, corresponding insight was people feel guilty eating in front of their pets. So uh, like, do you have any other data points uh, because of which you uh, came up with this insight that people feel guilty about it? Or just based on this data and information, you were able to uh, you know, come up with this insight? So it's not just like a linear process that this leads to this to this. It's also like uh, lots of other information around it that helps to get to this insight. So for example, when you're talking about uh, feeding at breakfast and dinner time, there are also questions around, okay, uh, you know, do you feed, uh, do you give food to the pet after you have eaten or before you have eaten? You try mm -hmm. and see that, okay, uh, most of the people say, you know, we typically give food to the pet and then we eat. And uh, some people also talking about that, uh, you know, we have already given food to them during lunchtime. It's not their time for the meal and they will just still sit there and they're waiting for the food. And, you know, it's an overdose for them. So mm -hmm. it's like uh, different, different aspects, different questions are asked to get mm -hmm. to this insight. This is just one of the insight for the angle that our clients were going for. There might be some other angle around feeding twice. It could be about the nutrition or the level of nutrition. And then your insight might be slightly different. Yes, yes I thought so because uh, uh, I thought you would have asked other questions and based on other data points, you would have uh, come up with this insight. So just wanted to clear that up because there could be, as you said, other reasons also, maybe health reasons or any other reason why people feed their pets twice. So just wanted to clear that up. Thank you so much. Okay, thanks. Any other questions from anyone? Or would you like to unmute and ask? Uh, Arunima, also just to let you know that uh, there were about, uh, I think, 75, 80 people who had joined the live streaming today. So, um, yeah, I, um, so I think most of them are also there in the session as of now. But yeah. Um, All right. Okay, so uh, if there's no other questions, then we just thank everyone for joining us. And uh, thanks, Arunima. Thanks a lot for doing this for us, uh, for the sharing. And then we will be sharing uh, this uh, video as well on YouTube. We'll be marking you and also on LinkedIn. So, and uh, thanks for sharing uh, all your uh, insights about insights. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.